You know, this year was unique as an ESPN college basketball announcer because out of the 55 games that I did this year, 45 of them were from a home studio that ESPN uh, built for me. So it was a unique situation to broadcast games this year. Uh, and I found out quickly, even in a home studio, just like I'm in a, 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 on site for a game, when I put on a headset, there's a lot of noise. I have anywhere sometimes from 10 to 20 different microphones or voices or noises coming through that headset. From the live microphones on the courts, we can hear the sneakers squeaking, we can pick up the crowd noise, we can hear the coaches, microphones by the bench, I can hear the director in my ear, the producer in my ear, the stats person in my ear, the play-by-play -play person in my ear, uh, the AP person in my ear counting us down to, down, down to breaks, in and out of commercial. There's a lot of stuff going on in my headset, a lot of noise, a lot of noise. And it was unique this year because I would be in Fayetteville, Arkansas, broadcasting the game. Carl Ravitch, my main play-by-play -play partner, would be in Connecticut. Our producer, a lot of time, was in, was in Florida. The statistician sometimes was in Ohio. We were all spread out, and that headset was of great value to all of us, more than in a normal situation. And, but I quickly learned there was two dials on my master control panel that I had to hear. I could do away with all the other noise in that headset, but if I couldn't hear my play-by-play -play partner, and I couldn't hear the producer, I was going to be in for a world of trouble. I was going to be lost in the broadcast. So I had to make an intentional effort two hours before every game to make sure above all the other noise in my headset, I could hear the producer and the play-by-play -play person. All the other stuff was extra, but I had to hear that. And that speaks to my heart every single day because out of all the other noise out there, I need to hear God's voice. It's, an, it's a challenge to me, like I'm sure it's a challenge to everyone else in this room. Satan, though, is the master of deceit. He is the enemy. He has studied your game film already this morning, looking for an opening, looking for a weakness, looking for a place to attack. He came to destroy, to kill, and to steal. And he's after everyone in this room, including me. And that visual of he studies your game film probably speaks to all of us. Because as you prepare for a game, man, you're putting on that opponent's game film and you're trying to find where can we get him. The enemy is the expert at that. Very, very subtle. Doesn't bring it to our attention. Doesn't want us to know that he's studying our game film, but he's studying our game film. He's looking for an area to attack and he's so good and so clever and so talented at getting us distracted with other noise in our life. What are some of those voices? You might be saying, Jimmy, I don't, I don't hear any other, I didn't, I don't hear any other voices in my life. I hear my voice when I'm speaking. I don't hear, well, voices come in different forms. How about the voice of jealousy? The voice of comparison? You want to get on social media and start scrolling through Twitter and Man, you start comparing your people to other people real quick there. That's a pretty strong voice. The voice of bitterness. The voice of I'm not worthy. The voice of greed, complacency, lust, pride, insignificance. Those voices scream at me at times. I don't know about you. And sometimes they whisper. It's a very subtle steady, slow, persistent whisper of greed, envy, bitterness, resentment that just won't go away. I need a voice above those voices that's speaking truth into my heart and speaking truth about who God is, speaking truth about who he says I am, speaking truth about those lies and how they should not get into my heart. Those things can overwhelm us. They can redirect our path. They can redirect our life if they're loud and we pay attention to them. Now, back in 2008, which is probably, I don't know how far I am from Vanderbilt's campus right now, but uh, Tennessee had just won at Memphis on a Saturday night and became the number one team in the country. 
They came to Vanderbilt on Super Tuesday, uh, ranked number one. And there was some bitterness at the time between Tennessee and Vanderbilt, Bruce Pearl, Kevin Stallings, both friends of mine. Uh, that game was a huge game. We opened the game that night, me and Vince Gill at the Ryman Auditorium, playing guitar, singing a song, him making fun of me as a singer. It was a big, big game. And that building, that Memorial Gym, was as loud as any arena I have ever been in. And I've been in all of them across the country, for the most part. At the first TV timeout, Vanderbilt had jumped out to a 10-2 to 2 lead or something. Shane Foster was knocking down threes. And during that first TV timeout, Brad Nessler, my play-by-play -play partner, took his headset off, and I took mine off. And he leaned over about this far from me and at a pretty loud volume said, man, this place is rocking. And he had to say it loud and get really, really close to me in order for me to hear that because of all the noise going on. Also looking back at that game, no matter how loud that building got, Kevin Stallings could, <laughs> and his guys heard it. It was amazing to me how in tune their ear was as a player to a coach's whistle above all the other noise in the building that night. But I think, I think back at that and I think how close I had to be to Brad Nestler to hear him that night is to me a perfect picture of how close we need to be to God to hear him on a day-to-day -day basis. You might be saying, well, Jimmy, how, how do you know that's true? Well, I, I know it's true because the scripture tells me in James 4, verse 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Your prayer time, your reading of his word, it all draws us closer towards him. It's like taking a, a it's like being on a boat, you may have heard this analogy before, throwing your anchor to the shore and then pulling your boat towards the shore. That's what it does when we spend time with God. We drag ourselves closer to God. We're not pulling him towards us. But it's so important to spend that time with him every day. I love the story of Elijah in the Bible. In the, in the, in the Cliff Notes version, Elijah had a closeness and an ear for God that was uncommon. One, one that we can all have if we have a heart to get there. But Elijah's ear was in tune, man. It was in tune with God's voice. God spoke to Elijah and basically told him, I want you to go to a mountain and wait for me. I want to speak to you there. Elijah, Elijah heard God's voice and he was obedient. I love the simplicity of that. He heard his voice and he was obedient. Two very important things for all of us. But if you know the story, Elijah went to the mountain waiting to hear from God. And as soon as he got there, there was an earthquake, a violent storm, fire, all those things that tried to get his attention, thinking that God's speaking to me in this earthquake, he's speaking to me in this fire. Elijah knew, no, I know God's voice, and this is not it. After all those storms and fires and ground shakes went away, then God whispered to Elijah. And that same close, intentional ear that Elijah had with God's voice, we can have as well. We can have as well, but it takes intention every single day to get there. I was watching the Masters, when it was a month ago, somewhere in there, maybe six weeks ago, two months ago, I'm not sure, um, I believe it was on Saturday, and Vern Lundquist was calling the 16th hole. And a golfer by the name of Billy Horschel uh, missed a putt for birdie on the 16th hole. And I believe it was his fifth or sixth putt of the day that he had missed from a makeable distance for those guys on a pretty regular basis. He, he lipped one out on the 16th hole. If you go back and watch that film, when Billy Horschel missed the putt, you could see him look up at the heaven and say, what do I got to do? What do I have to do to hear God's voice? What do I have to do? 
It has to mean something to me. As busy as everyone is in this room, from Scott Drew, who just won a national championship, to anyone here, this may sound a little harsh and a little tough, but you guys are coaches. I think you hear this and you speak this language. No one is too busy to not spend time consistently with God. No one. I would ask you, do you give 1% of your day to God? 1%. That's 14 minutes and 24 seconds. Are you consistently spending just 1% of your time with God and allowing him to change your heart? That's the first challenge I want to put on you this morning. As you kind of step back and start looking at your own game film, if you were to be evaluating your life like you evaluate your team after a game, and you look at your life right now, and you're brutally honest like those films show us after a game, the title of my book, The Film Doesn't Lie, your film doesn't lie right now. Where are you in your time alone with God and an intentional heart and an intentional ear day after day after day after day after day? Which is what made Tyler Hansborough, by the way, the National Player of the Year in 2008, according to Roy Williams. He told me Tyler Hansborough never got bored with the basics. Every single day, he outworked people, he outran people, he outlifted people, he outprepared people, he, he outrebounded people. He never got bored with the basics, became the National Player of the Year. Where are you on your film right now in that area? This next area is one that has really changed my life and changed my view of the word forgiveness. Forgiveness. I had a nice email uh, ministry going for about five or six years, um, up until about seven or eight years ago. And there was probably a thousand people on that email ministry at one point, coaches, athletes, friends, different people. And I, I, I went back and looked at some of the emails that I wrote uh, as I started preparing for my book. And I had actually written an email uh, one time about forgiveness. And it was a nice little two or, two or three paragraph email uh, on, on forgiveness. And I knew a lot about forgiveness in my mind, looking back at that email that I wrote. I had the scripture and some really clever analogies and, and different things. I, I, had, I, had, I understood the word forgiveness in my mind, not in my heart. Not in my heart. My dad, who passed away in the fall, always told me, you think you're fast until you run against someone that's fast. Then you find out. It's the same way with forgiveness. You think you know the importance of forgiveness and how to forgive until it's your time. Until it's your time. I, had, I met my time. About five years ago, I met my time. I had something in my life that grabbed me by my heart, got inside of my heart, and resentment, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness was growing out of control until God grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me and said, no, we will not go down that path. My whole entire relationship with my heavenly father is based upon that word, forgiveness. And he's serious about it. He wants us to understand it, not in our mind as much as in our heart. So what God started teaching me over a six or seven month period about forgiveness was a, it was a tough lesson. It was a hard lesson. It was a lesson that I didn't want to learn, to be honest with you. I had unforgiveness in my heart towards a person in a situation that I said, I will not forget this one or forgive this one. I was done wrong. God took me to the, to the lesson and said, here we go. 
I believe this with all my heart right now. No other act is tied to obedience more than the act of forgiveness. That is an obedient choice as a believer that you have to make. You have to make the decision because forgiveness does not come natural for anybody. We're not wired like that. We're selfish, sinful people that want to hold on to stuff and make it about me, 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 me. But if you want to experience true forgiveness in your life towards a situation, it's going to have to begin initially with, God, I don't like this. I don't want to do this, but I love you and I trust you and I am going to be obedient because you have told me to forgive and I'm going to forgive. That's as simple as I can put it. In Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus tells us, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their sins against you, your Father will not forgive your sins. Those are startling words from Jesus to us. I want us to pray just for a second. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, I know in a room this size right now that there is unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, anger in hearts. Lord, you know the number. And Father, I pray that you teach all of us in these next few minutes about how serious you are about that word. Call us to an obedience, Lord, that we've never experienced before to a new level. And God, cleanse our heart. May our heart be right and pure before you in this area of our life. And I ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Startling words about forgiveness from Jesus himself. I want to read for a minute because I don't want to mess this up. Why would he give such a bold, harsh warning? Because when we don't forgive others, we are denying our common ground as sinners in need of God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness of our sins is not, it is not a direct result based upon our willingness to forgive others. Make sure you understand that. But it is based upon our realizing that what forgiveness really means. It is easy to ask God for forgiveness, but often difficult to grant forgiveness to others. Paul teaches us in Ephesians, do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger, all brawling, all slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. Over a period of time, God really opened my eyes and my heart to what that meant. And I chose obedience towards that situation and forgave and forgave and forgave and went to and talked eye to eye, had a tough conversation, continued to forgive, forgive, forgive to the point that I felt really confident that my heart was cleansed of that situation. And just as I got to that point, God directed me to another scripture and said, we're not done yet. Through it all, God taught me that forgiveness is a daily choice to live my life grounded on grace and love for others. The second level of forgiveness that he will take you to, just like he took me to, is praying for those that have hurt you. God wants us to have a cleansed heart, completely cleansed, with not one root still remaining or one spot still remaining. He wants a cleansed heart. I love the synonyms for cleanse. He wants to disinfect our heart, sanitize our heart, launder our heart, purify our heart, scour and scrub our heart from unforgiveness. Forgiveness is serious business. In Romans 12, it says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. That means ask for favor from God for someone who has hurt me. When I first started doing that, again, it was tied to obedience. I, I had forgiven the situation. I still wasn't ready to start asking God to give them favor. But that's when I had to decide, am I, am I going to be obedient to God's written word? 
or am I not? So I chose obedience. And day one, day two, day seven, day 14, when you get to that point and you start praying for blessings and favor upon a person who has done you or you think has done you harm, wrong, that complete forgiveness, that complete disinfecting, that complete scouring of your heart takes place. I don't know who in this room right now is thinking, Jimmy's speaking to me. But I know in a group this size, someone is holding on to something from their past that's a heavy burden, a heavy weight, that's keeping you from your best with God. God is serious about forgiveness. The third thing I want to talk to you about today is about our spoken words. I, I, I fail at, I probably have already failed at this once, twice, or ten times today. I started kind of learning about this uh, a couple of years ago. I was very, very fortunate to be doing uh, Duke at Louisville on a, on a Tuesday night. I believe Duke was ranked in the top five at the time. Louisville was ranked 15th. And uh, Reese Davis and I were doing the game. I tell this story in the book, but I, I love this story. And on a, on a game day for announcers, we go to the practices. If they're like Coach Drew, let us in, get to visit with the coach. Uh, so we were there in the Yum Center, and Duke came in, and Coach K got his team going. Then he came over and started visiting with, with Reese Davis and I, just about his team, about where they were, uh, talking about Louisville, their strength and their weaknesses, things. We, we talked the X's and O's of the game for a while. Uh, and, then, and then somehow, Coach got on the, the word leadership and kind of what that looks like. I, I, maybe Reese asked him, who's doing a good job of leading right now for your guys? And that kind of got him going. Um, but he made the comment during that game, or during that, during that pre-game practice. I remember writing it down in my notebook, and I wrote it today. He, he says, I never allow my actions or words to display that I am not confident in what we're going to do next. You have to have a strong face, even if you do not feel strong. Reflecting back on my military time, the men you are leading better not see any hesitation or uncertainty. The leader has to display total confidence at all times. I guard my words and only speak positive things until I am certain of the direction we need to go. He said that after he told me, you'll be surprised how many times in a game I don't know what to say and I don't know what to do. So I asked him, what do you do at that point? And that's what he said. I, I was shocked at the all-time winningest coach in the history of the game openly admitted, there's a lot of times I don't know what to do. I mean, you think a guy like that has seen it all, is ahead of it all, always out in front of it? No. He's not. None of us are. So during that game that night, I don't know if anybody remembers the game, Duke was down 21 points with nine minutes to go, and that game was over, except it wasn't over. Duke went to a full court 2-2-1 press, went to a zone, Louisville got impatient, turned it over a couple of times, took a couple of quick shots, the lead went from 21 to 15 to 12 to 9, boom. Duke came back and won the game. In regulation by, by three points, I believe. Zion Williamson had a tremendous last seven or eight minutes. We spoke to Zion after the game about, tell us about the timeouts. And he said, even when we were down 21, coach just kept talking positive to us not really knowing what to change in the game until he made the change to the full court press. I thought that was so cool how the conversation I had that morning played out before our eyes on national TV that night. The impact of our words can change a game. More importantly, it can change a life. And as you start to kind of evaluate your film in this area right now, what do your spoken words say about your heart? What do your spoken words say about who God is? Do they align with what his word tells us? Or do you just branch off and 
run with your mouth sometimes that, that does not align at all with what God says about a situation or something on, on our path of life. Proverbs tells us, he who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. Bob Knight once said that in order to win, you have to first eliminate what causes you to lose. And, and for me, being transparent, my tongue can get me quicker than anything else in my life. It can trip me up. My, my, my tone, a, a, a word that I might, might say here or there, uh, a, a, a wrong attitude I have, a harshness in my own family, with my own family, I wish my tongue was better. I understand the importance of it better now than I did four or five years ago. Is your conversation full of grace for others, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to respond to everyone? It's amazing to me, before I ever go on national TV, the last thing I do before I leave my hotel room is get on my knees and pray for God's protection over every spoken word that I will say while I'm on the air. I can't remember the last time I didn't do that because it's very important to me. My career is very important to me. God has given me a stage to stand on because of it. But I still am disappointed in myself at times that I place so much protection and so much value that I, that I get down literally on my knees in my hotel room praying for God's protection over my words while I work. I don't have that same burning desire in my heart for the other 22 hours of my day. I'm learning, but I'm a little out of balance there. Do your words sound the same in your world uh, on an official recruiting visit as it does the rest of the time? Do your words sound the same in that in-home visit as they will once that young man or young lady gets to your campus for four years? The value of our spoken words, so important. When worry, fear, anxiety, concern, when it comes across your path, are you quick to just melt and, and shrink at the screen? Or do you say words that are promises from God about that situation? Or do you just accept it and get picked off and the guy makes a layup? The enemy makes a layup. It's become so important to me in my home that right now, if you came to our home in Arkansas, we probably have 15 yellow sticky notes up around our home that sim simply say, our words matter. How we talk to each other, me and Tiffany and our daughter Kennedy, how Kennedy responds to us, how we respond to her, how we respond to different situations, our words matter matter. How easy it is to scorch the life of those we are closest to. In Matthew, Jesus says, but I tell you that every man will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. I really think this is a coaching clinic as much as anything this morning. I see coaches held back all the time, reaching their full potential because they could draw up an out-of-bounds play or a, or a zone press breaker or a specialist as good as anyone in the country, but they miss on their words. They miss on their time with God. They miss on their balance in life. They miss on... Having bitterness in their heart, they miss on so many key areas. They never reach their potential that God called them to as a coach. I think this is. I think. I think this time today is more important than any coaching clinic you will attend all summer long. 
I think it's more important than if Scott Drew got up here honestly in the, in the next two hours and talked about his, his man-to-man defense. It was phenomenal this year. I think it's more important than that. You know, the, the, the idea of discipline our tongue is not new. I didn't come up with it. I didn't come up with any of this stuff. I love the story of Joshua and Jericho. You know, Joshua was told by God, you're going you're to take, you're gonna, you're, I'm giving you Jericho. And this city had two huge walls built all the way around it. It was, you could not get into Jericho. It was completely surrounded by two giant walls. But God told Joshua, I'm going to give it to you, and here's how you're going to go about it. You know the story in the Cliff Notes version, God told Joshua, lead your people, thousands of your people, in a march around Jericho every day for six days in a row. And on the seventh day, you'll march around six or seven times, I forget for sure. You'll blow a trumpet, the walls will come down, and Jericho will be yours. That's, that's, a, that's a crazy, amazing story. I love the story. What I, what I really like about that story is God also told Joshua, while your army is marching, no one is to say a word. That's just one sentence in the Bible and everybody just kind of goes on. I wonder why, I, I, I thought, why, why, why would that be? I know why that would be. Because God knows our words matter. I believe he knows that if he hadn't put that rule into place, the very first day on the very first lap, just like on your team, dudes at the back would have been saying, this is ridiculous. You kidding me? Like this is going to work? Who takes a city like this? And one guy talking to two becomes two guys who talk to four, four talk to eight, eight, and before you know it, all 6,000 are confused and not believing and not trusting because they ran their mouth, they didn't trust God. And they didn't say what God has already spoken into their heart. So God said, I'm not going to deal with that. They got to be quiet. I love I loved that inner part of that story, that God knows our words matter. I think it's an area of life where you have to determine that the enemy can no longer get to you, influence you, Guard your thoughts when you're alone by yourself. Guard your tongue when you're with someone else. I'll say it again. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Where are you in your game film right now with your words? Man, they're so important. So important. As a coach as a husband, as a wife, as a dad, as a mom, as an influencer. Our words matter. Our words matter. Last thing I'm going to talk to you about, because I have five minutes and 46 seconds according to that clock. (laughs) There are some great questions in the Bible. Some great questions in the Bible. I I love the one early uh, when God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? He knew where they were. But he just kind of wanted to see what they said as they were trying to hide from him because they had done something they shouldn't have done. I love the question Jesus asked his disciples, who, who do you say I am? That's a good one. That's a really good one. Huh. Who do you say I am? I love what God asked Moses at one point. Are my arms too short? Now, the story of Moses in the Old Testament, it's, it's a great one. God used Moses to, to lead the Israelite people out of bondage from Egypt, did, did miracles to get them to this point, and at, at one point they are out in the desert wandering around, and God provides them everything that they need uh, in the form of food and water. They're, so they're in the desert, and every evening, every morning, God literally sends down manna from the heavens to feed the throng of people that Moses is in charge of leading. It's, it's a miracle of all miracles. 
that God's providing food every day on the ground for them to go and pick up. And they make it into bread to, to, to sustain them while they're waiting for God to continue to move them to, to the promised land that he has for them. But as most people, they get greedy and they get bored with the basics and they aren't satisfied with God and what he's done for them. And they start complaining and bickering and moaning and, and Moses is hearing it. What has God done now? He's let us out here and all we have to eat every single day is manna. We want meat. I can hear him with a chant. We want meat. We want meat. And it wore Moses out. It wore him out. They're complaining. Their ungratefulness. Their greed. So Moses took it to God. And, and Moses was so distraught and upset that he basically told God, just kill me now. This isn't worth it. If you, if you have favor upon me, God, kill me now. That's how distraught that he was. Because my people, 600,000 plus people are asking me, we need meat. And we want meat. And God says, okay, I'll give you meat. God tells Moses, I'm going to give you meat. And then Moses, though, as great of a heart that he had for God, he still came back to God and said, really, really, how are you going to provide meat? If we could take all of the fish in the sea every day, that's not enough to feed this massive amount of people. And God says, I'm going to give you meat, enough meat not only for one day or two days or five days or seven days, or a month, you're going to have meat literally up to your knees. That's how much I'm going to provide. If you know the story, God sent a windstorm in that delivered quail for as far as you can see. And they had meat. They had so much meat that they, 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 they loathed it, the word says. So much meat that it was coming out their nostrils, the word says. But before he did that, after Moses complained and questioned God, God asked the question, my arm's too short, Moses? Scott Drew, are my arms too short to do for you at Baylor what I said I was going to do? Coach, are my arms too short to take away that forgiveness you have in your heart right now? Coach, are my arms too short to change your tongue, to change your words? Is that what you're telling me? Are my arms too short? Are my arms too short to change your complacency towards me that you know you have and you walked in this room? Really? Really? My arms are too short. Are my arms too short to change the little effect that Jesus has on your life from week to week to week? Are you too lost to be found? Hmm. You're saying my arms are too short to reach and grab you and hold you and love you and change your life. God's arms are not too short. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory forever and ever and ever. As I close this morning, I'm now one second over. Have you quit pursuing God? Complacency is a killer, man. It's a killer on a team. It's a killer on our walk with God, complacency. If you quit believing God's promises, because there they are in a, in a Bible that needs a new cover, I refuse to do it. I, I, I want a Bible 
in my life that's worn out. I wish I spent more time in it. But I want a Bible in my life that's worn out. Because guys that I know in my life that have a worn out Bible are also guys I know in my life that kind of walk through life with a little bit of a limp because they've been knocked down. They've had to go to God's word to keep them going in life and to give them hope and a savior that promises eternity for all of us. So I want you to take a moment now as I'm gonna close this in prayer to just reflect on the four things that God laid on my heart. Maybe it's just for one person in this room. And where are you in that? This is, a, this is a coaching clinic. Just like any other coaching clinic you go to, there's a lot to being called to a whole other level as a coach. You don't need another out-of-bounds play. You don't need a better zone offense. You don't need a better man-to-man -man defensive scheme or we funneling baseline or force in the middle. You don't need that. Those things are important but they're not as important as the leader and as the coach being right with God. Let me pray for us, please. Heavenly Father, I believe that you have heard the, the hearts and the prayers from all four corners of the room this morning. I ask you to forgive us collectively of our doubt when we say your arms are too short. Father, I ask you to refresh our hearts in a new way to pursue you that press upon our heart that you're always there. You want to be able to whisper in our ear and to, for us to know your voice above all the other voices. Father, we love you. We know you have a specific plan for our life. I thank you for every individual that's here this morning. I pray that they will continue to be blessed by the phenomenal uh, speakers and leaders, Lord, that are uh, after me today. Pray for travel safety for all of us uh, this evening as we head back our way. But Father, above all else, thank you that you're here. I thank you that you're gonna change the hearts and change the lives of people in this room this morning. And God, we love you and we need you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, amen.